بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالق الاصباح ذي الجلال والاكرام والفضل والانعام الحمد لله الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ونبيك وحبيبك وصفيك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفضل وأطيب وأطهر ما صليت على أحد من العالمين وصل على أخيه ووصيه من بعده علي أمير المؤمنين وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبط الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين وصل اللهم على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف القائم الحجة المهدي أرواحنا فداه وعجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والذابين بين يديه بإذن الله أحب قائمة محمد المهدي المنتظر صلوا على محمد وآل محمد My dear brothers and sisters, I was talking in my first sermon about the migration of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina after 13 years of spreading the message of Islam and hard work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted the Prophet to leave Mecca, his hometown. In all those years, almost 13 years that the Prophet was struggling to spread the message of Islam, only a handful of Muslims embraced this faith, only. Not more than 200 Muslims in 13 years. Which shows that Mecca was not the fertile ground for this religion. And the Prophet وسلم, was looking into another place, another environment that is more receptive and more embracing to this faith. Mecca was not the right place. It was the right place to start, but it wasn't the right place to continue. And the Prophet was looking for another society that is more embracing to his message. So he decided to migrate from Mecca to Medina. And if you observe the history of most of prophets of God, you see that most messengers of Allah went through the same process. They migrated. So for example, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, after exerting so much effort, in spreading the message of Allah in his hometown, Babylon. He couldn't, he could not further his cause. And he had to migrate from Iraq, from Babylon, to Palestine, where he settled along with his family. Musa, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, after spending years in Egypt, under the Coptic rule, he wasn't able to further advance the message of Allah. He had to migrate along with the children of Israel during the Exodus, in which all the children of Israel left Egypt toward Sinai and ultimately Palestine. Jesus, alayhi salam, he had to migrate from Nazareth into northern Palestine, spreading the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It seems that migration is, has been a destiny for most prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
because once they start spreading the message of Allah, they encounter, they encounter a vicious cycle, a vicious campaign by the pagans and by the enemy. And therefore they have to look for another place, another environment in which they do, they continue. They never give up. Giving up is not an option for the Prophet. Allah tells the Prophet, continue your message, continue your mission till you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Mecca, Meccans exerted a lot of pressure on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to give up. And they sent him a message through his uncle Abu Talib that tell your nephew to stop spreading this message in return, we are willing to give him anything worldly he wants. If he wants a wife, we can find him the most beautiful wife. If he's looking for wealth and money, we will give him money as much as he wants. If he wants to be our king, we can announce him as our king. Abu Talib comes and delivers the message to his nephew that this, this is the message I'm bringing you from those people, that doesn't mean I accept the message or I embrace it. I'm just forwarding their message to you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam answers, and he's alone, and he has only a handful of people around him. And if he was looking for any political victory, that was the time. Meccans are begging him and willing to negotiate. But he was not a politician. He is a man of God. He is a messenger of God. He says, my uncle, tell them, not Mecca. If they give me the entire world, if they put the moon in my right hand and the, uh, the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, meaning if they give me the world, so I would abandon my mission, I'm not going to do that. Until I prevail or I die, one of the two. There is no room, there is no option for giving up for the Prophet. He has been commissioned by Allah to spread the message of Islam. He's not going to give up, even if that cost him his own life. So the Prophet وسلم, like any other Prophet, decided to continue. And with the permission of God, he left Mecca. Before leaving Mecca, in his cave where he was hiding for a few days, and as he was leaving the cave, he looked, he spotted the Kaaba from above, from the top of the mountain, he spotted the Kaaba. And he gave his farewell bit to the Kaaba, knowing he will be leaving Mecca for an uncertain time. The Prophet وسلم, choked up, he was being very emotional. Very emotional over leaving his hometown, the city that embraced him, the city where he was born in, the city of his ancestors. So as he is looking at the Kaaba, his tears were flowing on his cheek. And he speaks directly to the Kaaba. And he says, Inna Allah ya'lam anni ma ziltu uhibbuki. God knows I love you, Mecca. God knows I love the Kaaba. God knows that this is a hard decision for me to leave the Kaaba and to the land of the Kaaba. And Allah ya'lam anni la ziltu uhibbuki. God knows I still love you, Mecca. Walakinna ahlaki akhrajuki, akhrajuni minki. But what can I do? Your people are, are forcing me to leave you and seek refuge, refuge somewhere else. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends Jibreel on the Prophet, bringing him the good tidings that, Ya Rasulullah, you will not be away for a long period of time from your hometown. Allah shall bring you back to Mecca. While triumphant, 
while the victorious you will be coming back to Mecca in a few years. It is he who took you out of Mecca. He shall bring you back to Mecca. And الذي فرض عليك القرآن لرادك إلى معاذ. The one who commissioned you with the Quran, the one who made you his messenger, he will bring you back to Mecca, Ya Rasulullah. Don't worry a lot. And this is exactly what happened eight years later. Eight years later, this refugee, this fugitive who left Mecca, fearing for his life, came back triumphant. Eight years only with 10,000 Muslims marching into Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the victory over Meccans and asked him to enter Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Mecca back to his dominance. And Islam became the dominant force in Mecca only eight years later. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam comes to, Mac to Medina and he settles there for 10 years till he passes away. My dear brothers and sisters, before I conclude, I would like to make a few comments on a few com contemporary issues and then I will adjourn my khutbah inshallah. So the first comment I would like to make is we had elections in this uh, uh, in the midterm elections, it was last Tuesday, and I would like to congratulate the winners in this election, particularly our Muslim brothers and sisters who won, our Muslim brothers and sisters, for the first time, for the first time, Michigan is sending a representative to the House of Representatives in Washington to the Congress who is Muslim. Sister Rashida Tlaib, who is originally from Palestine, won the, her seat in the Congress on the, I think, 13th district. And she became a, the first Muslim Congresswoman from Michigan and maybe in the entire United States. And that is history, my dear brothers and sisters. We never had, we never had before a Muslim sister representing us at the U.S. Congress. And this is something new that we need to be happy and proud of. So I would like to offer my sincerest con uh, congratulations to Sister Rashida Tlaib, who I know personally, uh, for her victory and for being the first Muslim from the state of Michigan being elected as a congresswoman. Also, there was another victory in the state of Minnesota, where another cis Muslim sister won a seat at the Congress, Sister Elhan Omar, who is not only Muslim, but also who wears hijab, alhamdulillah. And she became the first ever muhajjaba my dear brothers and sisters, 20 years ago only, 20 years ago, a Muslim muhajjaba was not allowed to enter a Congress in a Muslim country like Turkey. Turkey, which is predominantly Muslim country, 20 years ago would not allow a muhajjaba woman who was elected by people in Turkey would not allow her to enter the Congress, the Turkish Congress, with her hijab. They told her, either you remove your hijab and enter the Congress, Turkish Congress, or you will not be allowed altogether. And that is in a Muslim country 20 years ago. Now here in the United States of America, where the president of this country two years ago said Islam hates us, now we see a Muslim muhajjab, despite that president, and despite all critics and opponents and adversaries, she enters the U.S. Congress with her hijab. Isn't that a big victory for Islam and for Muslim? This is a big victory. 
That is God's will. No matter how much Trump and his cronies try to fight Islam in this country, Allah will still stand with us and he will enable us to achieve more victories, inshallah. In fact, the election itself was a big disgrace for this president. He kept on talking about his achievements, but this election dealt him a big blow and proved that he is not popular as he claims to be. And there are many people in this country who are non-Muslims, but they do not like his agenda and they do not support his racist and narrow-minded agenda. So I would like to offer my congratulations to all those who won, including our own new governor and others who won those, this election. And I look forward to see more of Muslim participation in the elections. My dear brothers and sisters, that's the only way we Muslims can advance our cause by influencing the political process, by encouraging our young men and women to participate and to run for office, whether local offices, in the municipalities, or in, for the mayorship, or for the state representative, or U.S. representative, or U.S. Senate, or judgeship. We Muslims have no choice in order to integrate in this system, but to run for offices encourage your young brothers and sisters to run for offices. This is the only way we Muslims can have a strong voice in this country. This is the only way the world and America will respect us when we are part of the system and we, when we occupy seats at the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Senate, which is soon to be, inshallah. My other comment, my dear brothers and sisters, is about the newly impose sanctions on Iran. So last Monday, State Department declared that they are going to impose severe and crippling sanctions on Iran. And when our Secretary of State, Pompeo, spoke, this is what he said. Listen to this. It's very ironic. He says, the reason we are Im imposing those sanctions on Iran because we want to bring democracy to Iran. I want to tell our Secretary of State that, look, at least there is some democracy in Iran. Their president is elected freely. Their Congress and Parliament is elected by their people. And instead of taking Democracy to Iran, I have another suggestion, su suggestion for you, Mr. Pompeo. Take democracy to your friends in Saudi Arabia. Bring democracy there. Iran do not, does not need your democracy. Saudi Arabia needs your democracy. Your allies in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, they need your democracy. They talk about having strategic relationships with Saudi Arabia, which knows no democracy, which has no tolerance to any opposition, and who treats, who treat their opposition with iron fists, with the bone saw, by cutting them into pieces, and by adding acid to them so they evaporate and there is no trace of their body altogether. You need to take your democracy to Saudi Arabia. Iran doesn't need your democracy. And I want to tell him one more thing, that with your crippling sanctions, you're not hurting the government of Iran. You are hurting the people of Iran. 80 million Iranians will suffer from those sanctions. Despite his numerous reiteration that we're trying to influence and hurt the government, in fact, all what our administration is doing, they are hurting the innocent people of Iran, people who should not be held accountable for any political consequences.
And therefore, I advise our administration to drop the idea of imposing those ugly, unfair, unjust sanctions on the Iranian people. If you truly care about the Iranian people, then leave them alone and don't impose further sanctions. And lastly, it's about Yemen, my dear brothers and sisters. Last week, the New York Times published a story in which it says there are 1.8 million children who will die soon, within a few days, if a miracle doesn't happen, due to the starvation, famine, and the war imposed by Saudi Arabia on Yemen. Those are human beings. Those are innocent kids dying. And you know what? It is our government, it is our administration that's helping and facilitating this genocide. It is our arms and weapons that is killing the Yemenis, innocent Yemenis in Yemen. And the U.S. administration should wake up soon before more casualties will die, before more innocent people will die in Yemen. They have to understand that those people are human beings. They are not animals. Even if they were animals, the world would have done something. I shall remind you, my dear brothers and sisters, for those who remember, two years ago, two years ago, the guard at a zoo in Ohio killed a chimpanzee called Harambi. I don't know if you remember that or not. And the world was upside down over the death of Harambi. And CNN comes with the title, an international outrage over the death of Harambi. Who is Harambi? It's a monkey that was killed and the U.S. Re reacted angrily over his death. Those Yemenis' life is less valuable than Harambi's life? Yes. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters. Trust me. Our administration cares about the life of a, a monkey, chimpanzee, more than it cares about 1.8 million Yemeni children. That's the fact. That's a fact, my dear brothers and sisters. And it is an embarrassing and disgraceful fact that we care about animals, one animal, more than we care about 1.8 million innocent children in Yemen. We pray for those kids. We pray for the defenseless Yemenis who have no way to defend themselves. Al-Mushtaka ilallah. Finally, my dear brothers and sisters, I should remind you that tomorrow, Saturday, غداً أيها الأحباء لدينا تفسير القرآن ساعة ثمانية مساء باللغة العربية. أرجو منكم الحضور والمشاركة إن شاء الله. كل يوم سبت ساعة ثمانية إن شاء الله. الأسبوع اللي بعده. سيلقي المحاضرة ضيفنا العزيز القادم من كربلاء المقدسة سماحة العلامة الشيخ عبد الكريم الحائري الذي حل علينا ضيفا قبل يومين سيتحدث مو هذا السبت السبت اللي بعده لكن كل يوم سبت ساعة ثمانية عندنا إن شاء الله تفسير قرآن هنا في المنتدى Also on Sundays we have lecture every Sunday at 11 a.m. proceeded with a breakfast and you are all invited to join and to be with us as well. And أيضاً أيها الأعزاء ستكون هناك ندوة يوم الأحد هذا الأحد مع الأستاذ الدكتور عباس كاظم من واشنطن ليتحدث عن نتائج الانتخابات الأمريكية هنا في المنتدى الإسلامي يوم الأحد الساعة السابعة مساء بإذن الله. أعزائي ختاماً هناك حفل لدعم ثانوية ومدرسة المبرات. There is a fundraising dinner for to support Al Mabarat Great Revelations Academy. And that is going to be on December 8th, Saturday at 6 p.m. I encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, to support this noble cause, to support this academy, to support this uh, school that is taking care of our children. So 
Tickets will be sold here at the office, at the front office. For those interested, please proceed and approach the secretary and buy your ticket along with your family so we can all be there on December 8th, inshallah. Allahumma khfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'awat innaka qadhi al-hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir wa ila arwah al-mu'mineen wal mu'minat wa li shifa'i mirdana wa qadai hawa'ijina نقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة